Thanks so much, Heather. It's great to be here. And uh, it's my first time giving a presentation in this world. So it's very exciting. And I want to just say hello to everybody before I get into the presentation. And uh, it's great to have a chance to see everybody and, and get a sense of the place, but be physically present in two dimensions. And uh, I've enjoyed seeing all the presentations over the week. And it's been wonderful to explore this amazing world and have fun on the beach, going on speedboat rides. And uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy this presentation. And I'm going to talk you through a bit of my journey into immersive technologies, but I'm also going to make sure that my connection is working fine. So Heather, if there's any problems, please do let me know and I'll try to ad lib and, and get through this. But it's uh, it's a long journey for me because I've I've kind of been working in technology for about 20 years now. And and I want to take you on the, on the process that led me to this title today, which is designing a moral foundation for a digital future. This term that describes the inter integration of physical and digital lives. And I began by studying my, my PhD, philosophy, ethics, and applying that to technology. So I was very excited by some of the things that we heard in the previous presentation, talking about how mind technologies would be adapting and modifying ourselves in ways that could transcend sort of human limitations. And it's that interface and how the technology transforms our lives that's always engaged me. So so for me, thinking about ethics and technology has been has been there for quite a long time. And and for this presentation, I want to sort of guide you through the recent research that I've been looking at, particularly around immersive technologies, but how that interfaces with a whole range of other emerging technologies from artificial intelligence to ingestible technologies and everything in between. So the central sort of proposition that I want to make is that we, we need to think about the ethical foundation to to designing XR environments. So to try to make sure that we come to terms with the range of ethical concerns that apply to this, these worlds that we're creating and to really think about how that's applied in the design process from the very start. So just to walk you through where I began with this recently, which is a project that we completed, funded by the Wellcome Trust in the United Kingdom, looking at how young people navigate digital spaces online to make sense of their own health, their own identities. And of course, young people today, we were looking particular sort of secondary school age range, so between 11 and 18 year olds. And we wanted to understand how do these young people use their devices to make sense of their health, given the range of technologies that are around them and how complicated it is to actually make sure that you can find credible information that, that works in a, in a way that extends their own sense of agency but also allows them to to trust what they find as well and I think that's one of the key things we, we found in the project so so thinking about the health implications of digital environments has been a central part of, of the project to, to make sense of these these different challenges that we face so after that project we created a, a range of videos that give us a bit of a sense of the the kind of conclusions that we had out of the project guidance that we could give to young people in navigating these digital worlds but also hopefully guidance that can be given to parents to teachers and to policymakers to help think about where to take the next generation of digital technologies and the challenge is huge because it's it's something that uh, within healthcare, there's often a sense that the technology, the cutting edge of technology is still far in advance of what's available within the public domain and within the healthcare services. So trying to find a way to bridge the gap between what young people have access to um, at their fingertips and what the healthcare services are able to to use is a big part of this this challenge. So I think one of the key challenges for us has been to try to make sure that we can give useful advice to to young people particularly, but the people that guide them especially to get, get them into a place where they can hopefully um, make sense of, of this imminent future where we see a, a greater use of digital technologies within that space. But this started even earlier for me where I began to really get a sense of the, the different technologies that were being used by people to try to modify their own sense of physical activity. So here we have in this video, you'll see the, the, the very popular game Dance Revolution, which has gone through various iterations over the years, but has been, I think, a, an example where we see that digital world emerging, this physical and digital world that's allowing people to to really explore new aspects of physicality 
that that hopefully take them in a direction that is bringing those two worlds together rather than separating them out. And I'll go on to talk a bit about why I think that's important, but it has something to do with the way in which screens occupy our attention, how they divert us from other behaviours and habits and, and activities, but also then perhaps limit our engagement with a range of physical activities. So thinking about that dilemma, which has really been a persistent concern in the public domain over the last 15 years, I would say, where we've seen governments uh, very anxious about the growing use of digital technologies to the neglect, perhaps, of physical activity. So so trying to bridge this gap is, is a big challenge in policy terms in particular, because, of course, people still also want to make sure that people can make the most out of digital technologies. And digital innovation is at the heart of, of many of our sectors, of course. So there's a desire to innovate and a desire to to push people towards digital and, in fact, to streamline healthcare in a way that that hopefully allows it to be more efficient and more cost effective, but at the same time an anxiety that this, this leads to the exclusion of physical or face-to-face -face interactions. So this is one of the challenges we're facing when, when trying to design these futures. And, um, and we've seen lots of interventions from the healthcare sector in particular, and I'll, I'll focus partly on health, but it's partly to think about how health uh, interfaces with a whole range of other ethical concerns as well, which I'll come back to a bit later. But here we have an example of a virtual world created by the Older Hay Hospital in Liverpool, which was designed to be a place where people could visit the hospital virtually and get a sense of it. So rather than go to a website, they could enter the hospital virtually and become more familiar with it and, and hopefully feel more welcome in, in the environment rather than feeling like it's a place that's somewhere to be afraid of or, or anxious about. Um, and and over the years, we've seen a whole range of interventions in this direction. So a good example is, is Google Fit, which you may have seen in the last few years has partnered with the WHO to create a fitness tracking environment that hopefully guides people towards healthier behaviours and gives them data that helps them understand what are those kind of fundamental benchmarks of living a healthy lifestyle that allows them to then um, make sure we can they can sort of manage their health themselves without having to get into healthcare support. And I think that's a big part of, of what this is, whole direction of travel has been, to try to promote agency and as a result, try to ensure that the, the burden on the healthcare sector is less than it would otherwise be. And integral to this is the integration of emerging uh, emerging technologies so here we have babylon healthcare's ai interface ai backed interface which attempts to triage your condition and then lead you into further services so how can we use these sorts of tools to hopefully understand what people are comfortable using but also to make sure that we have not just intelligence but care for people and it was really interesting speaking to young people in our research we, we learned that many young people are quite indifferent to the prospects of artificial intelligent doctors essentially diagnosing and treating them but um but they they just want something reliable and robust so it's interesting that these sort of anxieties we've seen over the years of of people wanting to push back against the possibilities of of kind of ai taking our jobs taking the role of the human out of the equation is in fact something that young people today don't feel too strongly about they just want the thing to work and whether that's being well or whether it's getting your amazon delivery correct it's it's a very much a functional approach to to the service and uh, we've seen lots of experimentation in recent years with this. So here's an example from a few years ago, which is uh, an attempt to then use uh, augmented reality to transform the labels of products into calorific information. So that if you are trying to and wanting to ensure that your calorie intake is, is minimized or at least in a way that allows you to remain healthy, you can then get a good sense of what this looks like and feels like so that you don't go too beyond your limits. And I think those are good examples of how uh, the design sector has tried to innovate in a way that gives people greater insight into the lives that they're leading. Because I think there's also one of the things I've noticed by studying technology more widely is there's a sense in which we have become disconnected from the means of, of, of technological design. And you can see this in so many sectors like um you know, the automobile, how how 20 years ago you could perhaps undertake sort of basic modifications and repairs to your own vehicle. But now everything is integrated into a technological system that makes that impossible. We've seen the same with mobile phones. Try to fix a mobile phone and you won't get too far. So there's a there's a way in which we've been sort of um, 
essentially moved out of the sector of of trying to manipulate technology and i think that this is in some sense an attempt to bring people back into the equation and allow them some agency and there are so many examples of tools that are trying to do this this is one that i like in particular the quantified toilet and uh, it's a, it's a it's a kind of amusing idea really but it's sort of is quite sensible as a principle because of course analysis of stools is a good indication of health and if your toilet can do this for you and tell you if anything is wrong then you know you've got a pretty good insight into a lot of information there so so we're seeing the emergence of these connected devices that allow us greater insights into our health and uh, and hopefully allow us to manage our health even more effectively and there's another example of a connected mirror that's out there that when you look in the mirror you'll see and hear information about how you're doing now we may not be welcome to everybody but the principle is there to bring that design interface into promoting agency which gets me closer towards the kind of core of what i'm saying which is the values that underpin that technological interface and how we design principles in it, into it that adhere to those ethical concerns so here's another example, one that's perhaps more familiar and, and, and uh, I, certainly for, for me, spending so much of my day on digital devices, being able to ensure that we can block out distractions, even limit the time that we're online, make sure that we have time for other things is a critical part of how we're seeing that design future emerge. And you see this particularly in social media apps. TikTok, I know, for example, has been experimenting more with digital well-being applications or features within their application that allow them to then uh, allow users to modify the amount of time they spend using the technology. So so there's a wave of concern about overuse of technology and a desire to bring uh, features into the interface that allow us to take more ownership of these new tools to, to bring about a more a healthier relationship. And I think we see examples of this in various facilities over the years. So I was one of the people that took glass, Google Glass around the world and put it on people's heads and gave them a, a chance to experience glass. And I think here's a, another example of how we can see that design interface sort of intimating at the possibilities of um, creating a different way of connecting with the technology. So this is from the Nanjing 2014 Youth Olympic Games. These are volleyball players. We put Google Glass on a number of athletes and saw what they did with it and see how it affected their performance. So so here we have that, that kind of scope of, of designing new ways of seeing the world, recording the world, but also interacting with the technology. And I think what I loved about Glass with all its faults and challenges was the fact that it allowed you to, to operate hands-free. And uh, the, the one example that I often use is the wink interface that allowed you to take a photograph by winking your eye, which many people regarded to be very strange. But if you think about it, we've been historically so attached to our to sort of our, our hands have been so attached to the devices that to free them up was really quite, I think, revolutionary. And I think it speaks to the emerging interfaces that we see around technological design more widely. So. I think these are examples of how transforming the interface liberates us and allows us to experience the world very differently. And that's a lot of what this is about. So what I've noticed over the last sort of five, five years particularly, but five to ten perhaps, is the in, in, increased in integration of these sorts of principles into design. So here we have a an example of an exercise bike at, the, at a gym in London that will convert your your output on the bicycle into energy for the environment in which it's situated. So how can we bring these two worlds together? And and I think that aspect of trying to think about the the the, the wider impacts of the digital lives that we lead as a way of trying to design better, design things that are not just brilliant ideas and completely sensible, but actually are attending to some of those bigger bigger concerns that we have beyond the individual. So you know, we're talking about planetary health and how we can use design as a way of trying to address things like climate change, things like our impact on the planet. And I think that's another sort of example, uh, which I'll come back to later, but sort of speak to this context. So, so yes, yeah, so Samsung's been designing these sort of future gym experiences that I think are, you know, a good example of how these these types of environments are becoming more prevalent. And uh, we, we will have a lot of video. This is a, a video just from the last week where we've seen the uh, Olympic Committee partner with Zwift, the virtual cycling platform, to try to create its own sort of Olympic virtual reality sport. And this has become a huge feature of the international sports um, uh, circuit over the last 18 months where we now have elite level athletes allowing us to 
to create completely new events, events that are taking place exclusively within these virtual worlds. So uh, the benefit, of course, with something like this is that the athletes can also stay where they are. So you don't have to travel across the world to compete, which allows you then to have hopefully less of a an environmental f impact as well when you travel. So I think that aspect of design is, is becoming an increasing feature of, of hopefully the world in which we kind of are building uh, new, new kinds of... Uh, audience experiences but also new forms of, of physical activity and that's where I think we're beginning to see a completely new era emerging around here where sports are trying to figure out their own virtual versions to bring these environments together. Uh, we've seen also things like ghost racing so this is a, a sort of real-time Formula E race where you can using your own console race alongside the uh, drivers as they're taking part in the race which is another new feature we see within this world so rather than just watch as a passive spectator you can also watch uh, you can also play and that playable aspect of i think uh, sort of visual con te televisual consumption is a key component of this new world that we're beginning to see emerge on the horizon so these new entities these new concepts i think are an increasing part of the future that we see we see this I guess embracing lots of different sectors as well. So here we have a, a trailer for the game Zombies Run, which was launched quite a few years ago now. But what was lovely about it, and this is a game where you put your headphones in, you press play, and you find yourself as a character in a zombies film, and you've got to run away from zombies. And of course, the main principle is to keep running, keep exercising. But here we have creative writers now becoming part of the exercise environment in a way that they weren't before so how how we can bring new people into this kind of creative space and allow us to create completely new communities of participation is a big part of i think this this sort of ethical foundation that i talk about so i think um trying to think about um, those relationships between digital and physical differently is at the heart of what I'm talking about. It's heart of this ethical or moral foundation, as I've described, rather than think about things as being isolated, physical or digital, how we can think about them as intimately connected. And in so doing, create experiences that hopefully allow people to be part of these worlds that otherwise they wouldn't have found a way into and i think that's where many people you know, we sort of like to think about sports as being inherently kind of universal but in fact many people do get turned off from sports at a very early age so to have these new sports emerging like haddo sport and you can see here there's a great sort of concept video out of haddo sport but this is a quite nice example of a of a uh, actual tournament that took place that gave you gives you a sense of what it actually feels like to see a Haddo Sport event occur. So we have here the physical experience of a kind of uh, Haddo court, but also that virtual reality interface where the players are interacting physically and digitally competing against each other. So I think those sorts of design features are, are responding to this anxiety we have about the increased sedentary lifestyles that people have led as a result of the rise of certainly gaming culture, but also the digital social lives that we lead now. And, uh, and I think that's a, a sort of shift in, in mindset to how we think about design. It's also, of course, a shift in terms of what's technologically possible. These things weren't possible until relatively recently. And I think it's the technology underpinning it is what's so exciting about this. So I've noticed over the last sort of few years as well, a growing desire to bring kind of moral and social concern into the design worlds of these spaces. So there's a uh, an organization that I've been working with, ITU, the United Nations Agency for Telecommunications, uh, developing a, a series of events called AI for Good. And a lot of that work is trying to think about the sort of social and humanitarian uh, not just challenges but solutions that can come out of the technology and it's a I think a good a good example of that is found in the world of esports where I've worked quite a bit in the last few years where we see the sort of latest test of computer intelligence being a test between the world's greatest esports starcraft player and uh, and google's alpha star computer program so we see now how these sorts of cultural experiences creative cultural experiences are a way for people to then to push the limits of technology so bringing those social humanitarian challenges into this world is in fact a way to innovate and i was thinking also about the launch a few years ago of the drones for good program at the uae which which gave rise to a drone that would plant a billion trees and, and these sorts of solutions i think are are all the more compelling today because they speak to those those wider issues that we face at not just as as individuals but as uh, as a as a species and as a planet as well 
And I work very closely with the Global Esports Federation as one of their commission members, where some of these principles are becoming part of that design principle of working with the organization. So we have a partnership with UNESCO to see how we can develop esports activities that respond to some of the sustainable development goals that they're working towards. And I think those aspects, again, are sort of fe emerging features of this landscape where when we think about sort of ethical design, we might be sort of quite focused on things like inclusivity, equality, diversity and those sorts of issues. But actually, I think we need to move much more towards a situation where we have an all encompassing sense of planetary health. Um, one of the quotes I've known for is, is the future of all sports is esports. And I think it's partly to think about those futures as integrated that I think can allow us to more effectively respond to those moral obligations we have when thinking about design technologies. So. For me, just to conclude, there are three sort of key principles to this moral foundation, which I think we need to address and also continually sort of invest into. And simple examples are are considering where where ethics fits into design courses. How do we get ethics into the programs where we teach these these design principles? And uh, for me, there are sort of three considerations. One is the first is the person. So I've talked a lot about health, individual health, how we can use technologies to really think about health in a holistic way. So not just talk about exercise and some of those sort of WHO metrics that underpin a sense of health, but the wider wellness of a person, their lives that they lead. So we talk rather about well-being than just health. So how do we ensure that the design of technologies enriches people's lives in, in rewarding ways? I think also we need to to consider the places in which we undertake these activities so one of the nice things about the sports activities and some of the earlier examples as well is that we relocate the digital interface from the home into new environments new arenas that are becoming kind of new spaces we see a lot of uh, around the world we see lots of uh, emerging esports arenas where we see some of these activities taking place in in manchester where i work we're now starting to talk to a leisure centre to bring in some of these sort of virtual sports into their place. And hopefully that'll be a way to encourage children into these environments if otherwise they might not be so keen. So thinking about the geographic spaces and being sort of sensitive to to those environments is another, I think, key feature of this, this moral foundation. It's really big. It's a bit like sort of contextual architecture, understanding how we fit these these new worlds into uh, the, the environments where they're taking place is really crucial. This is also crucial when you think also about the um, the way in which sort of digital innovation and technologies and infrastructures are distributed differently across the world so if we could put sort of technology into one place you know it might have one really great impact but if we can put it somewhere else it might do something very different and i think particularly here of uh, sugata mitra's hole in the wall project from a few years ago now where he took computers and just installed them into different sort of very underdeveloped places in india and uh, just left them there and allowed people to use these computers and otherwise there was no infrastructure at all and what happened is that people just learned stuff they just started to use the computer and figured stuff out. And I think that's a good example of how just by thinking about the context is really important. And then finally, the planet, thinking about how our use of technologies affects affects the planet. I've seen lots of examples recently where this has been a concern. So what happens when a celebrity shares a video on Instagram? What is the kind of <laughs> energy impact of that of that share when there are hundreds of millions of people that are then consuming that data and and what is the energy impact of it so thinking about those ways in which our digital footprint affects the planet more widely i think is another crucial part of this and those three things together i think are a reasonable sort of moral foundation for thinking about design and what i would like to sort of see more in the future is the integration of these sorts of concerns not just into sort of d design courses but also into the industry more widely we see examples from platforms like twitch and other big companies that are sort of attending to this in a way that they might for have done previously by thinking about things like csr and just making sure that they are attending to sort of publicly known concerns like safety of children on the internet but actually moving into a much stronger stance on the values that underpin their industries and that's where i will conclude thank you very much